Hello everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. It has to make me laugh, it has to make me cry, or it has to make me feel something deeply for one of the characters. So welcome to my 10 best and favorite books of the year. Well, it's been quite the year. Worldwise, health-wise for me, and even reading-wise. If I didn't tell you, I'm Marilyn Maya, formerly called the Baby Boomer Booktuber. So what do I mean that it has to make me feel something? Um, I need to feel an emotion that, make, that keeps me reading, and it has to be visceral. So I'm very happy that these 10 books have done it for me. And they're very different in every way. And I think that I had a successful year because I tried different things. And I didn't just stay with the same old, same old, which for me usually is mysteries, nonfiction. I went through every genre. And uh, so let's start with my favorite books of the year. Um, I don't have a lot of them for many reasons, uh, but I will have a photo on this side. So uh, we're going to start with a book that I never would have picked up because, uh, okay, I, I, I don't like big books and uh, I don't know why. I kind of do know why. I'm very impatient. And if a book doesn't grab me right away, um, I'm quick to put it down. But when I was in Paris, in 101 degrees, 102 without air conditioning, I caught COVID and I was delirious in a fever dream, you can say, when I read this book with a French theme. It was in an Airbnb and it was called Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Vaughan, and I'll have it right here. Um, so what is this book about? And why did it keep me reading, even though it was a big book? Um, I'll tell you why. Someone told me once that I should watch The Godfather because The Godfather has everything you need to know in life. And I have to say, I didn't really watch The Godfather all the way through, though I did watch certain points. But I think, and other people have said, in reviews that this book is like that book. It tells you everything you need to know about life. It's a classic coming of age story about Philip Larkin, who has a disability. Um, and in this disability has a club foot, which causes him to limp. And uh, he's an orphan who's sent to his uncle, who's a very stingy and very mean person. Um, and his aunt who's clueless but loving but clueless about how to take care of a child and she loves him but she doesn't know how to show it and he's raised in this vicarage uh kind of victorian feeling almost dickinson like and uh he goes to a boys school where he's bullied and that's how it starts off and it really kept my attention despite my having COVID, it kept my attention uh, between uh, doses of, uh, of paracetamol, they call it over there. Um, so it goes on, actually, uh, W. Somerset Maughan said that this was very autobiographical, though he changed things around. He actually had a stutter and he made it into a club foot, but I think he might have been an orphan and it feels memoir-like when you read it and you can't stop reading it because, you know, like I said, I kept on picking it up until the end. Um, so, you know, it, it deals with religion and his loss of faith when he prays to be released from the bondage of his disability. And, uh, well, that didn't happen. So um, he seeks now adventure. And that kind of bring, uh, goes into the whole story. 
and not to spoil it, um, he comes in. He becomes entangled with a with a waitress, who is a vile person, and uh, treats him terribly. But he can't escape the chains of that bond either. So it really shows this title is his need to escape the bondage of all of the terrible things that have happened to him and to live a happy life. And until he escapes the bondage of his obsessiveness, his love for Mildred, and learns to be happy. But it's also more than that. It has art. It has Paris. It has everything you can think of that makes a, a classic book special. So that's my take. That's my number 10. And I only made it number 10 because um, I don't know if I grasps, grasped all of the beauty of this book because of my having COVID. And then I caught COVID again but uh, when I came back, but that's another story. So my number nine pick is a smaller book, but just as powerful. And it's Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro and I'll have that cover here. So it's a perfectly paced three act story or drama uh, that is surprisingly, it's surprising like a mystery, but it's real in, this, in the sense. And I don't want to spoil it because it is such a short book. I tried to read it in Spanish because I couldn't find it in English and I do, I can speak, read better, but speak Spanish. But, um, I gave up on it because I realized my Spanish wasn't good enough. So what is it about? A woman, Elena, who happens to be my daughter's Elena too, uh, suffers from Parkinson's disease, a very, <coughs> excuse me, a very severe case of Parkinson's disease. And that made me think also, my father had Parkinson's disease, so it brought back a lot of memories. And she has a daughter and her, and they have, in the beginning of the book, you, sh you see that they have a very uneasy f uh, relationship. And her daughter ends up dead. She's sure that she's murdered and she goes on a trip to find out. And that's what the book is about. But she finds out much more than just about her daughter. She finds it's about life, it's about woman's power. It, it's, it's a powerful book and I really recommend it. Most of all, uh, I wanted to say that Claudia Pinheiro is a, a feminist and it has a lot about how society treats women in general. So that's an extra. Okay, my next book is Taste. It's my only nonfiction book in this group, but it's a special one and it's by Staniel Tucci. And I came to this book a little late uh, uh, by book two, but I'm so glad that I found it. Stanley Tucci, I don't watch his, um, he's on television in, in the US, but his book shows what kind of person he is. And I felt for him through his, the tragedy of his, uh, the loss of his first wife, his happiness with his second wife and all the beautiful, and very familiar to me, his, he was brought up in New York and he worked as a cook, a chef in New York. He started from the bottom. And uh, I just loved his recipes. I loved the Italianness of the book. I loved the New Yorkness of the book and I loved him. So that's all I'll say about taste. The, the, se the se seven, number seven, um, is a book that, um, this is not the book, but it's uh, George Simeon, his Inspector Magre series. And I, I'm showing you this book, um, Magre Mystified, because if I hadn't seen this in my library sale, I never would have gone on this uh, Magre uh, just wanting to read every book in, in, by George Simeon because he's such a wonderful writer. But my favorite book of his this year is uh, Grand Banks Cafe. I have that over here. And um, 
it's not one I thought I would love because it has to do with sailors and the sea and they the sailors stick together uh, especially when a policeman is doing a murder investigation but the characters are very distinct and the book is seething like a lot of his books are with female sensuality and with the modern 1920s 30s vibe of Paris and uh, even though you might say it's not seething with women's empowerment that it has so many female characters in his books uh, is something that I liked um, so the French northern seaport is almost as strong as the characters in this book and when the drunk sailors get their paycheck and they they go to the Grand Banks Cafe after one codfish sailing everything goes terribly wrong and uh, someone is killed and what I like best is Magray at the end sitting at the seaport moodily trying to figure out who done it so um, yeah I love this book and that's why it's my number seven book number six is a book that I picked up because of the British Woman's Library and it's called One Year's Time by Angela Milne now uh, it's a reprint uh, of this year so you can say it's my uh, new release of the, of the of the bunch and it's about uh, it's very modern and Angela Milne was the niece of A.A. A. Milne who wrote Winnie the Pooh series so that's interesting but this is the only novel that she wrote and it's you can say it's a romance but because of the or you can say it's historical fiction um, so um, this modern book is set in the 30s but it's published in the 40s and it's very frank for its time dealing with uh, sexual relationships uh, outside of marriage which wasn't really uh, talked about and I'm wondering if that was why she only you know she got a lot of pushback from it from you know backlash from it and maybe that's why uh, it wasn't uh, accepted as well maybe why it went out of print who knows so um, she works in an office and that's interesting too she has she's sort of a middle-class uh, English woman who is sort of on her own but she has family to back her up if things don't work out in the office and anyway the story starts with she meets Walter and they start a sexual relationship and that's very though it's not uh, done uh, very boldly you know that that's what it is and they go on where he lives with her she lives with him they separate for a while but I want to read you something uh, that she's thinking in this book Liza thought we can't go on if we're not married we're marking time when we were in London he went out in the evenings I was jealous if it was a woman and if it was a man I was resentful and uh, I thought he doesn't want me to meet his friends and when I did either I was his girlfriend or someone he had known a long time and would never be in love with according to the occasion and all the time I was waiting to be me so uh, she kind of wears she goes to Woolworths and wears a ring uh, when she's with people that she doesn't really want them to know that they're not married and the, the fact that they're not married uh, kind of comes into the relationship and he's quite a selfish guy um, and you can see that from the beginning I you know you're in Liza's head a lot and sometimes that's not a good place to be but it's surprisingly a modern story that you can imagine uh, some women are maybe not about marrying but just about relationships that uh, really I love th I love this book <laughs> that's all I can say um, number five I'm very glad I another historical fiction that I never would have picked up it was a gift 
and it's called Wild Geese by um, a Canadian author. Well, she's Norwegian, but she lived in Canada, Martha, Martha Ostenso. And I'm really getting to love Canadian literature. Uh, didn't know it was a thing, should have known it was a thing. But uh, like I said, I was more into my mysteries and literary fiction and uh, did not think this book was for me. And at first, when I first started reading it, then I said, yeah, this, maybe it's not for me. It sounds like, you know, a very typical story about a, a abusive father who rules the uh, household with uh, not a very, you know, with a iron fist, but it's so much more than that. By the second chapter, I was hooked. And uh, it's a beautifully poetic book about, well, it's, it's about that, about the father, but it's also about women. A woman who comes to teach in their home, or not in their home, but is going to live in their home and teach at a one-room schoolroom. And there's romance in it, but the main character to me and the heroine is one of the daughters who uh, is very resentful of her father. He's really cruel, by the way, and he makes them work day and night, the whole family. And the mother is mentally abused, and it's a terrible situation. But the strength of the female character uh, in this book and the sensuality and her wanting to live life and her blossoming is what makes this book just, just be wonderful to me. Um, number four and number three, well, number four is a tie. So I said I cheated a bit. I couldn't really pick one or the other to be better. And one is very short and one isn't. And they're two different uh, kinds of books. So it's a tie. Number four is a tie. I'll talk about the first one, Pilgrim's Rest by Patricia Wentworth. Now this book is very special to me on several levels. The first level is I read this with, um, I was going to cry for a minute. I read this with Janelle, who passed away this year. Uh, her channel, I think, is still up. It's too fond of books. And uh, she was mostly a mystery, but she did a lot of different genres. Wonderful person. And we, Buddy, read it together. And I suggested it because she was just getting into Patricia Wentworth, which can be a fail or uh, uh, you know, a win, depending on what book you choose. And uh, so it's a Mrs. Silver mystery. And Mrs. Silver is an older woman uh, who has sort of a detective agency on her own. And uh, she solves crimes one way or another. And uh, so I borrowed this book from the library. Um, it was published in 1946. It was well read, or should I say dirty, but. <laughs> So Mrs. Uh, Miss Silver and her two ex-students, who just happen to be policemen, are in it from the beginning. And I think she comes in at the end. I, I, I can't remember right now, but I'm going to find out. The story is action-packed, and the author puts in the right amount of romance and kind of suspense mystery. And Patricia Wentworth is known for more of a suspense kind of mystery. So the ending was a little implausible was not perfect but that doesn't it doesn't stop me from loving a book if a book isn't perfect it has to be perfect for me that makes it so I gave it five stars because of the setting this pilgrim's rest is a old house that has a lot of uh, people in it so it's sort of a closed circle mystery and of course mrs. silver with miss silver uh, who makes just every book come alive. And she comes in it at the end, now that I remember. But I loved this book, and I loved reading it with Janelle. Um, the Tie is, another, is a completely different book. Uh, it's only in Kindle, not Kindle, but only in digital form. I read it on my Kindle, 
and I'll have it here. It's not much of a uh, cover. It's called At the Hairdresser by Anita Bruckner. Now, Anita Bruckner can be hit or miss for me as well, but this one, oh, this, this hit me in the feels. So I'll read you one uh, sentence from it. Uh, I rather hope I shall die at the hairdressers, for they are bound to know what to do. At least that's what I tell myself. It's about an older woman. It's a novella. And it's poignant. Uh, it's short, so I'm not going to spoil it. Um, it's, she has a chance encounter uh, at the hairdresser and it, it brings change because she she kind of lives in a basement apartment and doesn't go out much to see people she's very old and yeah it made me feel lucky for what I have I don't know exactly how old she was supposed to be but her life her children don't she has a son who really doesn't come to visit her much and her life has gotten very small which happens a lot to older people and um, it really made me feel because she was very smart in this book I don't want to tell you too much okay now we're down to the three best books number three is by Barbara Pym and it's called an unsuitable attachment I love this book so much. I love Barbara Pym. I love almost all of her books. And this book is special because this is the book that was rejected by her publisher. It's the last book she wrote before her reemergence in the 70s. And um, so her publishing company declined it. Um, I'm going to add it eventually to my Barbara Pym collection. Um, so it really highlights the 1960s in England. That's one thing I loved about it. Yeah, it had vicars and the women who loved them like most of her books. But what made me make it number three was that I laughed so much in this book. This is high comedy at, the, at her best, in my opinion, because um, I'm reading now, um, her most famous book, which has some co a lot of comedy in it, but it's more subtle, Excellent Women. This book, she was like, I'm going to let it rip with the comedy. And I needed a laugh at that time. And I have to say that I laughed at a couple of things so hard that I was like doubled over. And that's enough to make it number three. Um, and the story also moves to Rome, which was very interesting. And the characters are, you know, her usual bunch of uh, eccentric characters. I'm not even going to go into all of them, except there's a lot. There's two cat lovers who are hilarious. And uh, my only, you know, thing about the book was that she repeats the title an unsuitable attachment. This is an unsuitable attachment that was. So you can guess that the book is about uh, people getting together or not. Uh, but who cares that she repeated this was an unsuitable attachment or that wasn't? I don't care. I love this book and you will too, I'm sure. Now we get down to the, the final two and one. And I have to say that it was hard. I was, I kept on, um, I kept on moving it from one to two, from two to one. But finally, I settled on this, this reason why I put them in this order, and it has to do with the length of the book. Basically, that's what it has to do with. But then, when I thought about it, I thought, no, number one would have been number one, no matter what. So what's number two? Number two is Foster by Claire Keegan, which is a novella. I'm reading a lot of novellas this, this year. I don't know if it was my, because I was ill or because um, my, my concentration level wasn't up to it or because these are the books that were lauded on book two. 
But um, in fact, this book was made into a movie called um, The Quiet Girl. And it was a good movie. But the book, the book is just wonderful. And it really, I can't tell you too much about it, except it's about a, a girl um, who goes to live foster, fostered by her mother's sister. Because her mother is pregnant. She, they have a lot of kids. The father is a ne'er-do-well. Is that a word <laughs> that's used anymore? But I'm reading a lot of Irish literature and they're so good about how they portray family life and go deeply inside the family. And this is no exception. It's wonderful. Um, so she goes to live there. She, she had a lot of work to do with her, her biological family, you can say. And she goes to live. She doesn't know when she's coming back. She doesn't know these people, even though the woman is her aunt. And she begins to flourish in their care. And that's all I'm going to say, except I cried. I cried. I don't usually cry in books. This book is the only one, uh, maybe Elena knows too, made me shed a few tears. This book made me burst out crying. And it's short. Uh, uh, Claire Keegan writes with such concise beauty and uh, description and I just love her writing anyway but this was could have been the, the best book that I that maybe I ever read uh, really it, it's in the top 10 that's how special this book is so Foster okay so what's my number one book number one now I do have it. It's called Alberta Alone by Cora Sandel, and it's part of the Alberta Trilogy. The Alberta Trilogy is by, uh, like I said, Cora Sandel. It's, a, it's very autobiographical account of her life. Maybe it says the, uh, I think it was the Christian Science Monitor who said this might be the most complete uh, account of a woman's life that, uh, in the three, Alberta and Jacob, Alberta and Freedom, and Alberta alone. So, you know, it's hard to get, you, you can read it by itself, but I think if you read it um, in order, like I did, you will get the most complete picture of Alberta, who's a creative, in real life she was a painter, um, and I think she's also was a painter for some time in this book too, but I'm not sure because I get mixed up between the real Alberta and the the Alberta that uh, is in this book um, because they're they're kind of interchangeable. So I won't tell you too much about this book except they're in they start out in Brittany, I think it is. Uh, north of Paris because there's the great influenza in Paris where the second book takes place and there are a group of people who are living together and I wanted to read you just the beginning of the book talks about that a group of people in a home they are held together by external laws and forced apart by internal ones the tension between them is expressed in a number of small events apparently without significance. In reality, a screen for fate, who spins, spins her mysterious threads behind it. So this is the kind of writing that, uh, that you're going to get. And the, I would assume that the Elizabeth Rokin is the translator. And she has to be like, she, she translated all of uh, the Alberta trilogy and more that um, Cora Sandel wrote. She has to be like one of the best translated books that I've read because um, this really um, made me feel that the words were similar to what so we can never be sure. I'm going to read you another part where she talks about the landscape and she's back in Norway. So this book moves from 
Brittany to Paris to Norway. So we have a sense of moving, moving through life. Um, in this case, we know she's going to be alone eventually because it says it on the flap, on the cover. So this sentence really brings the, the feeling of moving and how she does this. So the road which wound past the farm between two stone walls took one further into Norway. After 10 minutes walk, the structure of the landscape changed and became all uphill and down, the fields on each side billowing and advancing, a sea of curving lines in violent movement towards each other, the foreground of round, rich forms in green and violent, in full uproar. Down in the hollows were old barns, fences, aspen trunks, the color of plane trees, firs, young birches, white as chalk marks. Furthest away and eternally blue were the hills, but the houses people lived in lay always on the crest of a wave. So you can see the movement in that description of uh, the landscape. It's not just stable, but it, it, it's like she's walking and seeing how things are moving. And uh, her writing is just beautiful. And it also has a theme of motherhood, poverty, the, the, the feeling that if you're a creative person and you want to go into a creative field, how motherhood, especially in these times, could hold you back. And um, how sometimes you can resent your child for, for that. And um, I don't want to go into it any further, but uh, there's a blurb that says, on all levels, it is a pleasure to read. And I agree with that 100%. So that is my 10 favorite books of the year. And uh, tell me down below, have you read any of these books? Um, do you want to read them after I discuss them? Let me know down in the comments and please uh, comment, like, subscribe and all those great things. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful new year. I know that I'm hoping that the world and me personally and all my friends here on BookTube just have everything that life can give you and that your heart desires. So until my next video, I bid you as always, aloha from Hawaii.